The um, lecture uh, tonight is about computer architectures. And uh, what I want to do is I want to um, tell you a bit about the beginning of computing, which, of course, uh, started in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the beginnings was uh, in Cambridge with the EdTech after Manchester finished the baby there. Uh, we have uh, a period of uh, great um, uh, British home computers uh, that I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, then, having been around for a while and stepping back, uh, I felt that there were five distinct uh, waves of computing uh, that I want to quickly tell you about. And uh, it's quite interesting to stand back and view it as, uh, as waves, because then you can discern <clears throat> the individual properties that the waves themselves had. And I want to uh, tell you a bit about that, uh, how these waves clash, because they actually don't like to co coexist. Uh, new waves normally kill the old one. Uh, a little bit about Intel versus ARM, since this is one of those uh, wonderful uh, David and Goliath stories, and then end up with a, a couple of, paid, um, of slides on what next. So the beginning, uh, if one <laughs> <laughs> takes this view living in Cambridge uh, of computing, was of course the EDSAC, on the 6th of, uh, which ran uh, on the 6th of May. 49. The one thing that we can say, though, is that it was the first computer that was really used as a computer service uh, uh, regularly. So in that sense, it, uh, I think we can say that we were the first uh, computer service uh, in the world. Now, we're rebuilding EDSAC, as uh, some of you may, may know. Uh, may know. Uh, David Hartley, who is uh, here tonight, uh, organized uh, this. And we also have um, uh, Chris Burton here, who actually helped with the rebuilding of the Manchester Baby and his already given us uh, invaluable uh, advice on how to build, how to rebuild uh, the EdSec at, at, at Pletchley Park. And I, was, uh, I went to the kickoff meeting there and was just delighted to see that for the first time, I think, in history, we now have a circuit diagram of the EdSec. <laughs> because Morris, of course, never bothered to uh, write down the circuit diagram. And if he had, it probably wouldn't be accurate anyway, because he changed his mind during building it. Um, <clears throat> we also have a great, uh, uh, a great leader for the uh, replica project in Andy Herbert, uh, who was, uh, many of you, you know, from the computer laboratory in Cambridge, and he was uh, head of Microsoft uh, Research in Cambridge. And he is a, a very enthusiastic uh, rebuilder of aeroplanes and computers. So I think the project uh, has gotten off to an excellent start. Because in addition to the circuit diagrams, we also have a software emulation. So we know something that Morris didn't. And that we know that this computer will work. <laughs> <coughs> so the period of the EdSec was uh, 49 to 58. It's actually short. It's an acronym. It stands for Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. Know that, uh, note that it was called a calculator, not a computer, because what Morris called the computer, we would now call the ALU. So it was actually a calculator. And the reason why it was a calculator, I presume, was uh, and, and David uh, Hartley will put me right if I get this wrong, uh, that he, his uh, mission in life was to provide <coughs> uh, mathematical tools to the university. And he felt that a computer would be a good uh, mathematical tool for researchers to have. And indeed, I think two Nobel laureates mention uh, the EDSAC as an invaluable tool that contributed to their Nobel Prize. Uh, we also had an outstandingly gifted uh, programmer in David Wheeler, who is uh, widely recognized as the inventor of the subroutine. And this is a, a picture of the EdSAC. Here you see a young Morris uh, kneeling at the Mercury delay line. And uh, during that uh, presentation that Chris gave at, um, at Bletchley Park at the uh, beginning of the EdSAC program, uh, for the first time I understood how uh, the, the, the detailed architecture of this computer, <clears throat> which of course is a serial architecture, it's a bit serial machine. What I hadn't appreciated uh, was that every bit, the only storage that this computer had was actually the Mercury delay line. There was no other way of getting a data. So if you wanted uh, any datum, 
You had to wait until it came round again on that uh, Mercury delay line. So although, again, to my surprise, this machine ran at a megahertz, uh, which was only half as fast as the BBC Micro many years later, uh, the megahertz was on a bit serial machine where you had to wait for the bits to come round on a Mercury delay line uh, when you wanted to have a new a calculation or a new, a new datum. So the actual number of <coughs> instructions per second was surprisingly low. It was just 650, uh, given that it's, uh, it, it clocked at a megahertz. So it was not a lot. However, if you compare that uh, with the computing devices uh, that existed before, it was probably the, fast, the, the, the largest step increase in computing power ever, and probably will be the largest step in compute power uh, ever, because the step was 1,500 times. So if you look at Moore's law or the, indeed, uh, as I'll tell you later, the, uh, the invention of the arm uh, <clears throat> in terms of the um, increase in performance of, of comparable chips, uh, the ARM, I think, was outstanding in, in achieving a factor of 20 uh, over the Z80 at the time, but this was a factor of uh, 1,500. So quite an interesting um, event. Now, <clears throat> if you allow me, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the British uh, home computer period, because uh, we were leading the, the world in, in home computers at the time with the uh, uh, Zinclair ZX80, I should say, not Z80, uh, the Spectrum that was uh, um, produced by Sir Clive Sinclair, uh, the Acorn computers, the Atom, the BBC Micro, and later the Archimedes, and of course the, the ARM spin-out from Acorn later on. But what people often forget now is that there were many, many other computer companies uh, in Britain at that time. There was a, a thing called a NASCOM, NASCOM 1 and NASCOM 2, that we compared ourselves to at Acorn. Uh, there was the New Brain that we beat to the BBC contract. Uh, there was <clears throat> a Welsh machine called Dragon. Uh, there was the Jupiter Ace, which was a, a, a fourth machine. Uh, there was Tangerine, Oric One, Tadpole Torch, and uh, many more that uh, I um, can't remember anymore. So here are two iconic uh, computers at the time, the ZX80 and the Spectrum um, from a Sinclair. And of course, uh, by far the best machine at the time, uh, the <coughs> BBC Micro. Uh, now, why was it the best machine at the time? Do I have a slide on that? Yes. Uh, if you compared it with arguably the leading American uh, uh, machine, which was the Apple II, the Apple II ran at one megahertz. We ran twice as fast, so that's a factor of two right there, not to be sniffed at. Uh, we had 32 kilobytes of RAM, which was uh, a lot, and 32 kilobytes of ROM. We had color. Uh, the Apple was monochrome. We mixed text and graphics on a single uh, screen. Uh, the Apple couldn't do that. Uh, and we had something that no computer had at the time. We had a network connection. In fact, Acorn never produced uh, um, a fully-fledged uh, keyboard computer without a network connection. And we had 10,000 installed econets in British schools <laughs> before people knew how to spell Ethernet. <coughs> So we were leaders in uh, arguably all uh, of these uh, different um, areas. In addition to that, we really had outstanding software. Uh, we had BBC Basic, which was uh, shown off to Bill Gates when he visited us and tried to sell MS-DOS to us. Um, we had an Acorn OS, which was an operating system. And uh, one of the things we could uh, point out to Bill Gates is that um, we couldn't take a such a retrograde step as uh, <clears throat> uh, adopting MS-DOS because we actually had an operating system that was worth the name operating system, which MS-DOS certainly wasn't. And by the way, uh, we could tell him that uh, if you sat in front of a BBC microcomputer as, a, as a, a child in a British school, you could type star I am Johnny, and you would be logged on to uh, the local area network through the Econet, and you could download uh, files from the file server with load and store and, and save commands uh, as if it was uh, from the local floppy disk. And when I pointed this uh, out to a uh, bill saying that you could uh, uh, download this thing from the file server over a network, uh, Bill's response was, <coughs> what's a network? <laughs> 
so we, we were in the lead, uh, especially on the networking side. So you might well ask, why is the world not Acorn compatible? Why is it uh, Microsoft compatible? Well, we missed out on a trick, and that is uh, uh, willingly licensing uh, either the Econet or our, our basic, or indeed the operating system to other companies. This was just not a business model that we even entertained. We thought that this was our... Um, our competitive advantage. We wanted to keep this ourselves. Uh, Commodore, for example, approached us uh, asking if we would license the Econet to them to establish a, a standard, um, which we could have. Uh, and of course, later on, the Econet was uh, was uh, pinched by Apple and uh, called Apple Talk. So, um, <clears throat> but we, we, we were really the first ones to do that. The other thing that we did, which of course very much what the BBC wanted, was to uh, have a product that could be easily expanded. So we had every uh, interface that you could imagine at the time. We had HD converters, we had serial interfaces, parallel interfaces, and a one megahertz pass where you could uh, put a, a second uh, a processor uh, onto the uh, BBC Micro. Uh, Chris Curry, my a partner at Acorn, then produced a bit of a marketing coup by convincing the BBC to put their name on, on our computer and run at first a 10-part and later a 30-part series on computing. And it's sort of difficult to remember this, but I, I, I see some people, uh, enough white hair here in the audience, to uh, those of you would at least uh, remember this, that people would come home from having a beer at the pub at 6 o'clock because they wanted to watch the computer literacy program, called the computer program. It was just fascinating at the time. The whole nation was was excited about the chip, as they called it, because the first program was actually called the chip sedan. They didn't actually call it a microprocessor. They called it the chip. And there was this, uh, the BBC told everybody, there will be more than one chip in your home in the future. Little did they know. Uh, it will be tens and now probably hundreds, uh, because uh, I think the last count uh, was that you have around 50 in, your, in, in most, of, uh, most of your cars alone. And it was, it was just very, very uh, popular and led to a, uh, arguably to a generation of programmers uh, in this country uh, that created uh, uh, the uh, British software industry. And I'm just so pleased that um, Eric Schmidt uh, gave a talk at, uh, I think it was at Glasgow and, or at Edinburgh not too long ago, saying uh, that Britain had a lead with the BBC Micro teaching uh, pupils how to program and how what a shame it is that we squandered this lead because we changed our curriculum from teaching uh, people how to program to teaching people how to uh, <coughs> work Word and Excel and PowerPoint, uh, which you know anybody with half a brain can probably pick up just um, over the uh, uh, by using it or having some. Uh, internet help with it, whereas uh, programming, uh, I think, uh, requires a little bit of help from teachers. So we now have a new initiative, uh, which in fact was um, recommended by Steve Ferber, who is uh, with us tonight. He wrote a, a, a very important recommendation on that, which I think has now been uh, accepted, and uh, hopefully there will be changes in the curriculum uh, soon to reintroduce uh, programming into schools. So now the five waves of computing. They are, of course, the mainframe, the mini computer, workstations, the personal computer, and now, surprisingly, the phone. Who would have ever thought that the phone will become a major computer platform? But it has, especially in, connex in connection with the cloud. So the mainframe, uh, and I dug out some sort of iconic uh, <coughs> computers that characterize each of the, each of the, wa each of the waves. Uh, and the iconic mainframe, I suppose, was the IBM 370. I remember using that uh, computer at uh, Cambridge University. I also remember that a four megabyte upgrade arrived uh, whilst I was doing my PhD. Uh, lots of people questioned uh, the wisdom of having so much memory because they wouldn't know what to do with it. Uh, <clears throat> now, this, of course, was not a memory for a single user. This was memory for 200 users uh, that were at the end of teletypes there. The other interesting thing to note, and you might remember uh, films and, and, and newsreels and, and BBC uh, news on that, whenever you saw a picture of a computer, the key thing that you ever always saw were the turning uh, tapes, because that sort of defined a computer because it was the only thing that moved. So it was 
moved, uh, homed in on that. So what characterized mainframes? Well, they were quite expensive. They were typically a uh, million dollars or, or more. Uh, there were very few of them, only a sort of a, a thousand per year, although many of you know the famous Watson quote who was the head of IBM at the time who said there might be a maximum market of six for them in the, in the world. Well, he got that wrong. They were all multi-user. There was, they, they, they lived in air-conditioned rooms. <clears throat> the way you interacted with them was through teletypes. Uh, there was no network. Uh, and I remember during my PhD at the Cavendish, um, I'm a physicist, not a computer scientist, as many of you, many of you will know, uh, we um, were trying to predict. Uh, we, we knew about Moore's law, we knew about miniaturization, so we were trying to predict what computers will look like in 10 or 20 years' time. And... Um, and our idea of a really uh, miniaturized IBM 370, we decided, was a thing that looked like the, um, uh, the bit that we used to wipe the blackboard. Uh, because we argued that uh, we had to have an output device. And the smallest output device that you could think of was a printer that would run along uh, the paper to print out uh, the, you know, the printout that we normally got on teletypes. It didn't occur to us that you know, the sensible thing is actually to have a video that would be uh, giving you real-time output, because that just wasn't, uh, wasn't used at the time. The, the way you got the output is you, the, the output was printed. <coughs> now, the thing that I want to uh, point out in particular on this slide and all the subsequent slides is the use case. Because these use cases really defined uh, the computer at the time. Uh, the use case was uh, <coughs> central government uh, departments for sensors uh, or uh, calculating uh, shell trajectories, headquarters of large companies to do the accounting, and of course science to do scientific uh, um, <coughs> calculations. The uh, central processing unit, of course, were made out of uh, discrete components, often bipolar or ECL at the time. And there was very soon a dominant company, IBM. <coughs> to start off with, IBM had seven sisters. After that, it became the bunch. Uh, but really, IBM dominated uh, this wave. And this is a wave characteristic. If you look at all the subsequent waves, towards the end of the wave, you always have some dominant companies. And often you also get a lock-in that these dominant companies become dominant because they become quasi-monopolies uh, on the back of often some interface specifications, as was the case with the DASTY disks. Uh, I remember Rob Wilmot complaining bitterly to me that ICL will never be able to make any inroads on the IBM stranglehold because of the DASTY disk um, specifications. And of course they had it all. Uh, they were the a vertically integrated company. They took the sand off the beaches, made the chips, made the circuit board, designed the chips, made the circuit boards, uh, wrote the software, wrote the operating system, invented the languages like uh, COBOL and uh, Fortran, delivered the machine, serviced the machine, and finally took it away from you at the end of the period to scrap it as well. So it really was a soup to nuts um, thing. And then came the mini computer. And again, there was, uh, uh, in the end, a dominant company with DEC, with an iconic uh, product called uh, the VAC 780. As you see, it was a lot uh, smaller, and some VDUs started to appear as well. They were very expensive, and they weren't very good, but um, at least you <coughs> had some immediate idea of what was going on in the, in the computer. They were a lot cheaper than mainframes, uh, and therefore there were a, a, a lot more of them. But look at the use case again. Uh, it was still multi-user, but now universities could uh, uh, afford them, and maybe even university departments rather than just the computer laboratory. Uh, smaller companies could have their own computer, and the near engineering companies uh, could have it. And the CPUs weren't made out of uh, discrete transistors anymore, but uh, of course this was the age of the uh, 7400 uh, uh, series of um, uh, uh, MSI uh, uh, components. The uh, dominant company, of course, was DEC with the VAX, uh, and uh, there was also the rise of the Ethernet, that these uh, uh, computers uh, were actually networked together. 
and some of you might remember the, the amazing cables, that the, the deck cables, they were about a, a centimeter thick, and the way you, uh, you connected to your ethernet was actually through a connector that pierced the, uh, the, 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 pierced the insulation, and there was a very thick copper wire in the middle, and you would ram the spike into the copper wire, and that's how you made the connection to the, uh, to the, ether, the, the deck ethernet at the time. So it was a great period, but this a mini computer wave also shows a typical wave characteristic that the dominant company in one wave so far has never become the dominant company in the subsequent wave. And a particularly sad example, of course, is DEC, because DEC was uh, probably the most fabulous computer company at the time. They employed all the smartest people, uh, they had a dominant market share. And uh, when they went down, they didn't go down because uh, they became incompetent. They remained the best mini computer company in the world. The problem was people stopped buying mini computers because there was a new Belle de Jour called a workstation, and this was the iconic product of that uh, era, the Spark uh, station. Now, why did people buy the Spark station? Well, they were a lot cheaper. Uh, again, there were many more of them. So the use case expanded dramatically uh, to uh, now engineering, but <clears throat> almost personal engineering. Uh, people would have these workstations, as the name uh, suggests, on their desks. Uh, they were a single user. Uh, and after a, a period of shakeout again, there were companies like Apollo uh, uh, on the East Coast and then Sun on the West Coast. It was really Sun uh, that became the, the, the dominant uh, supplier. There was also a revolution in uh, CPU design uh, with RISC, a famous Spark uh, processor. <clears throat> a dominant operating system uh, uh, arose with Unix uh, and partially new technology from Microsoft. Uh, but one of the great revolutions was the CRT. And they were known as 3M machines at the time. R ridiculous looking back. Uh, uh, one megapixel, so it's 1,000 by 1,000. That's still impressive, although at that time, of course, it was uh, all monochrome. One megabyte of memory, <laughs> uh, incredibly small by today's standards, and one MIP of performance. Uh, storage became, uh, there was a revolution in local storage with uh, hard disks, of course, and networks, again, were very important. But the fourth wave did to the workstation what the workstation did to the uh, mini computer wave, uh, it obliterated them. And it was, if I may bring up this uh, slide, um, the BBC Micro that was uh, an iconic uh, product in personal computing, although they weren't called personal computers at the time. <laughs> at the time of launch of BBC Micro, they were called home computers. Um, and again, same story, a lot cheaper, $1,000 now, roughly, uh, <coughs> sold in the hundreds of millions. And the use case really was personal computing, characterized really by three main productivity tools, Word, BusyCalc to start off with, and Excel, and PowerPoint. Uh, and now, of course, internet browsing is probably the, the, the number one uh, use case. We're desktop machines, and uh, again, after a, a, a shakeout, during which IBM uh, became the only company to be dominant in two waves, albeit not subsequent waves. So for a while, IBM dominated uh, the, the PC business before they sold it off to Lenovo in, uh, in China. But we do have a dominant duo uh, uh, in the personal computer wave, called, sometimes called Wintel. Uh, that's uh, Microsoft and Intel, of course. And uh, the dominance here, interestingly, isn't uh, described as a dominance in <clears throat> the manufacturer of a computer, the supply of the computer itself, it's a dominance, uh, it's a dominance in two components. Uh, the microprocessor, where uh, Intel has more than 80% market share, and um, Windows, um, where um, Microsoft has uh, a more than 90% uh, market share. Um, although there is this peculiar company called Apple, uh, who are the only remaining personal computer uh, producer who actually understand what they're building. 
<laughs> it's, it's the truth. Uh, so, uh, let me tell you the Dell story, uh, as told by Clayton Christensen. Um, and you can find his talk. He's a very famous uh, Harvard professor, wrote uh, a very uh, important and seminal book uh, called The um, Innovator's Dilemma, on how people, uh, if they really innovate, uh, have to blow themselves out of the water every now and then by new breakthroughs, and how very, very few companies uh, manage to do that. And, but he's got a new uh, interesting story, and that's the Dell story. It's the Dell Acer story. So Asus was a sub-assembly uh, sub supplier to Dell. And they came to Dell one day and they said, um, you know this motherboard that you produce? Uh, we can produce this motherboard 20% cheaper. And it's not your um, key, uh, you know, your key competence. We can do this uh, cheaper and better. And by the way, you don't need a manufacturing plant anymore. You give this to us, so uh, your um, uh, return on, on equity goes up because your assets uh, are, are now smaller so you can uh, improve your share price. Uh, and and uh, the finance guys looked at that and said, this is a good deal. We can buy something 20% cheaper. We need less money to build it because now we don't need a factory. Our profitability goes up. And indeed, it did. And the share price went up. And this uh, story repeats itself uh, four times because then they say, look, uh, we're now doing the, the, the circuit board for you already. Uh, why don't we do the, um, uh, the case for you uh, as well? And then you know, we integrate it all and we, we, uh, we produce the whole thing for you. Uh, except the fifth time, uh, they came back and told exactly the same story. 20% cheaper, uh, we'll do it for you. But they didn't call on Dell. They called on Best Buy and Walmart. So. Uh, <coughs> What he reports is that every time the financial guy said, this is a good deal. This is what Harvard's uh, business school tells us we should do. We should increase the return of investment to our shareholders. And yet it hollowed out the company. Uh, you know, Dell does not really understand what is in their uh, computers anymore. Because they have, of course, apart from outsourcing all the, uh, the assembly, They've outsourced the microprocessor to Intel, so they don't know what the microprocessor is all about. And they outsourced the operating system to Windows, so they don't have a clue what the, what the operating system does. They just make sure that it runs on their machines. The one amazing exception is Apple, who produced their own processor, of course, uh, ARM-based, and uh, they have their own operating system. So that's why they can make such a compelling uh, product that is um, gaining market share. <coughs> However, <coughs> The iconic PC, of course, is the IBM PC. And here is the, the amazing uh, uh, thing looking back. Uh, some of you might remember. Who, who remembers the storage capacity of the floppy disk? Double-sided, right? I got to 320K, I think. So both of them would give you, say, 600K. This is not enough to store a single picture that we take with our mobile phones nowadays. Because, <laughs> now, isn't that a remarkable, uh, a, a remarkable fact? So in the same way that these previous waves always got blown out of the water by the subsequent waves, my prediction is that these smartphones plus the cloud will do to the PC what the PC did to the uh, workstation, what the workstation to, did to the mini computer, and what the mini computer did to the um, mainframe. And here it is, the smartphone, uh, held by a very smart man. Uh, it's very sad that he's gone uh, a little bit too early. He wasn't the most um, amiable guy to meet. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, was he smart. Um, <clears throat> and here, um, here are the smartphones. The price has fallen further. Uh, in fact, uh, it has fallen to zero if you buy a, a mobile phone with a contract. Uh, the units <clears throat> have again increased almost by a factor of uh, 10 over the previous wave. Uh, we're selling about 300 million PCs, and um, it's uh, uh, last year I think it was 1.3 billion. Uh, so it's, it's a factor of four higher than the previous wave. The use case has extended to voice now. Who would have ever thought that we'd talk uh, to the computer if we wanted to talk to other people? But that's what we do in a smartphone. 
Uh, it covers the internet uh, just as well as PCs now in terms of uh, browsing the internet. <clears throat> it can do video. It really can do everything that a PC can do, and most of it well enough. Uh, in the same way that the PC killed the workstation, not when it reached the, the same capabilities of the workstation, but when it was good enough, when it could do most of the things that the PC, uh, uh, that the workstation could do. And so it is with the smartphone. It's good enough to do a lot of the uh, web browsing, which is the main, the number one use case of the PC. And of course, <clears throat> if you watch especially young people, what they do with their smartphones, they don't make calls. Uh, they, they, they either text or they uh, use the internet or Facebook or, uh, or Twitter. Or For a while, there was a dominant European company, Nokia. Sadly, just last quarter, Nokia was overtaken by Samsung as the main provider of uh, phones in the world. But we have this very unexpected appearance of Apple here that had a minor market share in the PC business, but now has a major market share in the smartphone business, especially when it comes to profits that you might make with such smartphones, where Apple is still the leader, although Samsung is the volume leader. There is, delightfully, a standard CPU uh, for smartphones, in fact, all phones, with a 95% market share, and that's, of course, the ARM RISC processor. Uh, in terms of the hardware architecture, uh, it is uh, important to note, and that is uh, really the main reason why uh, I think Intel has such a hard time with ARM, is that the PC was dominated by a microprocessor. In fact, people would buy a PC because it had a 3 gigahertz Pentium rather than a 2.8 gigahertz Pentium. So even though what, what, what seems a, a, a trivial difference, uh, really, made the difference in the buying decision. When you buy a mobile phone, you normally don't know what, what megahertz or gigahertz rate the processor runs on. That's not important. By far more important uh, is the use case, <coughs> the user interface, touch. And if you look <coughs> at the hardware architecture underlying it, it's actually these guys that are much more important. It's the baseband processor, it's the connectivity, it's uh, GSM, 3G, HSDPA, which is the, the, the data uh, uh, thing for, um, the data channel for the 3G uh, connections, and LTE, curiously, uh, um, uh, uh, called long-term evolution, uh, more widely known as 4G, uh, has fantastic capabilities. They're completely new companies that appeared because, the, uh, because of the importance of the baseband processor and the radio connection. It is actually companies like Qualcomm, uh, a UK startup from Bristol called iSera that has the world's first uh, high-quality soft modem, uh, now bought by NVIDIA, and I think the combination of uh, NVIDIA and ICERA might well give Qualcomm a run for their money, Qualcomm being the dominant company in baseband processors. <laughs> Infineon bought by Intel because they realized that their microprocessor business is going to go away, and they have got to uh, find a way of uh, selling chips, which is what they're very good at. And the only chips that people buy in this market are uh, the... Uh, baseband processor chips, people do not buy microprocessors in the phone market, uh, which is the reason why ARM is doing so well. They license them. So here is a smartphone on steroids. Uh, it is exactly the same architecture. Uh, there is really no difference uh, between an iPad and an iPhone, uh, say, uh, with the exception of the size of the display. And, uh, even the connector is the same, as you know. So uh, this architecture is making its way now from uh, a thing that you hold to your ear to a thing that is so good at uh, browsing that it is serious competition for the PC. And as you see here, um, your speaker is uh, doing his main presentation out of an iPad, out of a tablet, uh, thereby usurping uh, one of the use cases for a PC. I don't need a laptop anymore. I can do this out of my tablet. And Apple, again, has done a superb job in uh, providing the, the usual um, uh, productivity software like uh, Pages, Keynote, and uh, Numbers, I think it's called, rather than Word, uh, Excel, and PowerPoint. 
So these waves clash. Why do they clash? And why is the new wave always uh, winning out the old one? Well, always higher volume, therefore lower price. Uh, new wave reaches old wave uh, performance or close enough, and then there are new uh, and uh, much more exciting use cases. Uh, it's these new users that give it uh, the great excitement and the uh, the ability to be victorious over the previous wave. Um, we've been through the workstation versus PC story, and now comes the PC versus uh, smartphone story. Because smartphones, I just put up smartphones there as a, a sort of as a tag for this new wave, but it's this new wave uh, has smartphones as its main. Uh, proponent at the moment, but the architecture behind the smartphone uh, is conducive to lots of different package stories. So it can be the iPad, it can be e-readers, it can be a phone, uh, but it can be lots of other things that we uh, will appear, especially in the in the health uh, sector as we go forward. The CPU is good enough and not so central anymore to the uh, success of uh, these new components, but the use of interface is. So uh, we've just seen a revolution in uh, the user interface and the way we, uh, we interact with, uh, uh, with computers away from the keyboard and the mouse to a touch interface. And I think a similar thing is just about to happen to voice and eye tracking. Uh, we have a, a very interesting investment in a <laughs> Stockholm-based company called Toby, which is the world's leading eye tracking company. And eye tracking is just one of the uh, uh, key ways in which humans <coughs> indicate to each other uh, that they're paying attention or who they uh, are, are talking to. And it's a very clever way of handing off uh, the, uh, the, the talk token, although it doesn't work with everybody. Um, <clears throat> then there are SD cards, which is a new uh, way of storing things. So who would have thought that you could have a, a 32 gigabyte SD card, which, is, uh, which you can buy at Tixons at the moment, when the IBM PC had 320 kilobits of floppy storage just a few years ago. But the most surprising thing, I must say, that came left field that nobody predicted was this last line. Who would have thought that Apple can produce an application platform that extracts 350,000 applications? And Google, not to be outdone, Android is actually now shipping more uh, smartphones than Apple and is <coughs> uh, <coughs> producing 250,000 uh, apps and they're actually growing faster than the uh, Apple App Store. Here is the Intel versus <coughs> ARM story. It's also a risk versus CISC story, a reduced instruction set computer versus complex instruction set computer. We actually looked at lots of different processes uh, at Acorn to follow the 6502 which we used at, the, at BBC Micro. And um, uh, we actually quite liked the 16032 from National Semiconductor and had a second processor based on that. Uh, we also looked at the 68000. We looked at the 8286 and uh, uh, actually did talk to Intel about uh, using that, but they used both, uh, they, they, they put both the data bus and the address bus out on the, on the same pins, so we, we felt uh, that nobody could make a, a sensible computer out of that because you couldn't get enough bandwidth. Um, you weren't making good use of the memory bandwidth. So we went to Intel and said, well, if you uh, sold us just the core and we had a different pinout, maybe we could make something of your chip. And they said, well, get lost. So we said, well, you get lost. We'll do our own. And that is the only reason why um, the ARM existed. Um, I remember uh, Steve and uh, um, Steve Ferber and um, uh, Sophie Wilson going to Western Digital uh, to check out what they uh, were doing in terms of a follow-on to the 65 or 2. And I think they came back much encouraged uh, that these guys there uh, weren't any smarter than we were, so we, we could actually uh, uh, produce such a chip. And then uh, <coughs> my major contribution to the ARM project uh, was to give the ARM team two advantages uh, that neither Intel <coughs> nor Motorola nor Semiconductor ever gave their design tool teams and those two advantages. One, uh, no people. So it's the only processor that I know uh, in the world that was actually created uh, by t just two people, plus then later on uh, the Glorious 12 who uh, founded ARM, uh, implementing it. But the actual architecture was done by, 
by two people. And the uh, second great advantage was I gave them no money. <laughs> so there was no way uh, they could produce a, a, a very complex chip. It had to be very, very simple. Uh, the interesting thing was because uh, the people who uh, did it were rather gifted, uh, they produced one that was very simple, but at the same time had very high performance. So it actually had the same number of transistors as the Z80, which was the leading 8-bit uh, microprocessor at the time, but it had 20 times the performance. So just because of the architectural brilliance of the design, we managed to get 20 times uh, the performance out of the same number of transistors. It's, uh, I think, quite a, a rare event. Now, there was a completely unintended side effect, and that is we held the world record of MIPS per watt. We weren't uh, producing this chip to be low power. Uh, we were producing it to be high performance and low cost. But the BBC was a uh, microprocessor, or the follow-on uh, products uh, called Archimedes, were mains-powered computers, so they didn't need low power. It was, it was a side effect. But Nokia knocked on the door and said, this is a rather useful for our uh, telephones, our mobile phones. And uh, uh, Robin Saxby, who at that time uh, then uh, ran ARM, grabbed this opportunity and established um, ARM as the standard uh, microprocessor in mobile phones with a 95% market share. Uh, this year we're going to sell 8 billion arms, that's more than people on earth, and more than Intel has sold in its entire history. Uh, we have the ambition of selling 100 billion of them uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, you might think that this is ambitious, but if you think about the uh, wave that is about uh, to hit us, which is the Internet of Things, uh, this could well be a factor of 10 uh, more per year than was before. It's also become the most uh, valuable company we have produced in the Cambridge cluster, which uh, with over a $10 billion market cap. And in the year 2010, which is now two years ago, uh, interestingly, the value of the ARM chips that we collect a royalty on has overtaken Intel sales, which is uh, over $40 billion. <clears throat> so even in dollar terms, ARM has now become a more important um, architecture than Intel. <coughs> Now, why is Intel having this problem with ARM? And uh, the interesting thing is exactly the same story as the DEX story. Uh, Intel has not become an incompetent microprocessor company. In fact, it must be said, they are still the best microprocessor company in the world. There is no doubt about this. Uh, the problem is people are not buying microprocessors in the uh, smartphone field. So however smart and good their microprocessors is, if there is no market for microprocessors in this uh, fifth wave, they've got a problem. And the problem is the business model, nothing to do with the processors. And the business model is that people like to license uh, the processors in the mobile phone business, not to buy the chips. So they've got to find a chip that people might want to buy in the mobile phone business. And of course, that's exactly what they've done with, by buying Infineon. And they're making uh, a good inroads into that market as the um, baseband processor. Interestingly, of course, the chips that they're selling into this uh, uh, market with Infineon has an ARM processor in it. <laughs> so it's the PC standard versus the mobile standard. Uh, this sometimes is depicted as a fight, a David and Goliath fight of ARM versus Intel, but that's actually not the case. It is Intel versus the, versus the world, because this, these are the ARM licensees, and there is not a single uh, substantial, well, there isn't a single semiconductor company of, of any note in the world that doesn't have an ARM license. There are over 200 for them, and this is just a selection of them. So what next? Well, uh, my prediction is that the mobile phone architecture will win out over the PC architecture uh, for all the reasons that I've uh, repeated a number of uh, times now uh, on my wave argument, uh, mainly the much wider use case than the PCs and many more apps. And the big question is, will Intel and Microsoft play a role in this new wave and this new standard? And the answer to this question is not clear. The one thing that we can say is that Intel is one of the smartest companies in the world, one of the best run companies in the world, and has, without a shadow of a doubt, the best processing capability in the world, which, of course, was always financed by the uh, uh, 
excellent marshals that they achieved uh, send the, se se uh, selling Pentiums in the, the PC business. So I would be surprised. I would not be surprised if Intel manages to do the same as uh, IBM did, because when they, uh, when the mainframe uh, market uh, seized, uh, IBM didn't see IBM uh, didn't seize IBM reinvented itself uh, as a service company. And uh, my prediction is that Intel will reinvent itself as a chip company that um, produces chips for this uh, market. And as I said, it's probably the baseband processor. Uh, Microsoft is an equally well-run company uh, with uh, uh, 40 billion of cash, so they can, uh, 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 they can wait a little while and come from behind as they always have. And their uh, pact with, uh, with Nokia uh, is not to be written off. Uh, they, the um, Windows um, uh, phone uh, um, operating system and the Nokia phones are really very nice phones indeed, although they still haven't caught the imagination of people the way that the iPhone has. And there will be many more device ca categories. So the reason why I've called this the mobile phone architecture is to stress the architecture. Uh, you know, you'll find this architecture in lots of different form factors, not just the mobile phone. But my prediction is that it will kill the PC architecture because you don't need such a heavyweight architecture for most of the things that we want to do going forward, especially if you have the backup from the cloud, and it will kill Intel's microprocessor business. So what next? Uh, well, we've got a very interesting uh, initiative using uh, a million arms in Manchester uh, in Steve Ferber's Spinnaker project uh, to simulate a billion neurons. Now, why is this a sensible thing to do? Well, if you look at what uh, we've done with microprocessors in the past, uh, what I call maybe the, the Intel program, uh, we've, or Intel, has produced heroics when it comes to coping the, with the mismatch of processor speed and memory availability. So if you look at a typical computer uh, which has an Intel processor in the middle, uh, you will find there's so much memory that, that is idling most of the time and a poor processor in the middle that is going flat out and the whole architecture with now three levels of cache is there to redress this, this, this imbalance between uh, the number of processors and the number of memory elements. Now there is of course an existence proof that a completely different architecture in the brain uh, where every neuron is both a uh, storage element and a processing element uh, has certain advantages in some applications. Uh, so to redress this balance and understand what might uh, make uh, <clears throat> multiple processors, a very large number of processors work well, where most of the time, most of the processors might not do anything, might be idling, but if you need them, they are there uh, with a very uh, low interrupt latency, because one of the problems with the present architecture, of course, is that the interrupt latency, especially if you've got three levels of caches, uh, is pretty bad. Same thing is true for energy consumption. If, you've, if you had asked um, Henry Ford what the best way of putting a a wheel on a car is, the last thing that would, who would have told you is uh, you get somebody to pick up the wheel, to give it to somebody, to give it to somebody who gives it to somebody who puts it on the car. But that's exactly what we do with three levels of caches. We just stage it and every time we pass the, the tatum on to the next cache, of course, uh, we consume energy again. Which brings me to the low power. I, of course, I've got no uh, uh, great uh, new architecture to present to you, but I can present some of the issues that I think might lead to really exciting new architectures. And one is uh, when I looked into what is the theoretical minimum on power. And to my total amazement, the, 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 the theoretical minimum for reversible computing, as I'm sure many of you will know, is zero. You do not need any uh, energy at all to compute as long as you can run it backwards, which is not surprising because if you uh, couldn't run it backwards, then uh, of course it wouldn't be low power. So it just has to be isentropic. We don't do that, of course. We, 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 we throw lots of state away, we throw lots of bits away. So what's the lowest power if you do throw bits away? And the answer is something that was uh, worked out in IBM research by a guy called Landau in the, in, for I, in the IBM Research Center in the 1950s. 
The price that you pay for throwing away a bit is uh, 1 kT log 2. So log 2 is roughly 1. Uh, K, of course, is Boltzmann's constant, so that's 10 to the minus 23. Uh, T is uh, a temperature in Kelvin, so you get two orders of magnitude there, so that's uh, 10 to the minus 21. So you can throw away megabytes and gigabytes of things and still be in the sort of microjoules. So the theoretical limit for uh, low power computing is way, way off uh, where we are at the moment. So there is enormous potential for improving uh, uh, the power consumption of processes. So one of the questions is, is the brain a good model? And one of the most exciting things I've been involved in uh, just recently is um, organizing a seminar at, um, at King's uh, in Cambridge um, uh, with uh, people who really understand architectures, uh, like uh, Stephen here, uh, David May uh, from Bristol, and a number of others. Uh, we're half of the people, and the other half were neuroscientists and uh, biologists. And the, one of the people there was Simon Lochlin, a zoology at Cambridge, who told us that neurons are 100,000 times more energy efficient uh, than computers at the moment. So they're doing something uh, right, and that's worth studying. So hints from theoretical neuroscience, I think, are, are very welcome. Machine learning is something that we still don't uh, do very well, and uh, neurons do do very well. And maybe Bayesian in inference is the right uh, uh, hint there. But uh, sort of my latest hobby horse uh, that I, I hope to follow up is that maybe the, the key uh, to um, understanding uh, new computer architectures, especially when it comes to machine learning and organizing ourselves efficiently, are these shortcuts, uh, these um, Kolmogorov uh, complexity for those that want to have a, a fancy name for shortcuts. And does that incorporate uh, salience? And uh, uh, I couldn't uh, um, resist uh, putting this Ähnlichkeitserinnerung here by Rudolf Kahn up, uh, because this is a, a book that I uh, uh, did a, um, uh, an Arbeitskreis on, a, a, a sort of uh, circle of friends that we had at Vienna University when I was a student. We read this book on the logical construction of the world. And uh, the way you construct the world is with this uh, wonderful, very short concept of Ähnlichkeitserinnerung uh, that um, loosely translated is the recall of similarities. Uh, which uh, our brain does uh, spectacularly well. So in conclusion, I uh, told you a little bit about the ETSAC, uh, and uh, uh, you know I, I, I am very keen to acknowledge the Manchester baby as well, of course. Uh, I talked to uh, you about the five waves of computing, uh, the clash between waves, ARM versus Intel, that the PR PC architecture has had its heyday, and that smartphone plus cloud is going to be the fifth wave uh, of computing. But uh, the brain is next. So thank you very much.